Do you want me to wait until I, there it is. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's nice yeah. to see you. And uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, I'm Patricia Storhan. I'm chair of ABTEL. I'm grateful for your time this morning and your presence here with us. Um, we're going to start this morning with introductions. And I will say I'm very honored that today our uh, Virginia Teacher of the Year is with us. Uh, Tara's going to introduce him in a little bit. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, we also have two new legislators to the committee. So I'm thrilled that uh, Jennifer McClellan and Skylar Van Valkenburg are here with us as well. Um, but we are going to go around and do some introductions before we begin. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Patricia Storhan. I'm chair of ABTEL. I am a representative of a private institution of higher education uh, from the University of Richmond. I'm gonna just walk through my list uh, and we'll sort of do this as a roll call as well. Um, so um, Andrew Deere, good morning. Morning. Introduce yourself. Um, I'm Andrew Deere, Dean of the VCU School of Education and Public Higher Ed Rep. And also Vice Chair for Abto. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Welch. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nancy Welch. I'm the current division superintendent serving Matthews County and, the, and the, off the beautiful Chesapeake Bay. I represent the school superintendents across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Uh, Gary Carter. Good morning. I'm Gary Carter. I'm with the Apprentice School at Newport News Shipbuilding and uh, glad to meet everybody this morning. Thank you. Tracy Mercier. Did I miss Tracy? We'll come back. Uh, Philip Watt. Good morning, I'm Philip Watt. I'm a kindergarten teacher from Falmouth Elementary in Stafford County. Thank you, good morning. Charlotta Williams. Okay, we'll move on. Selena Dickey. We'll come back around. Uh, Mary McIntyre. <clears throat> Stephen Witten. Good morning. I'm Steve Witten. I teach sixth grade language arts in Mecklenburg County at Bluestone Middle School. And I represent the middle school region eight teachers. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Wendy Downey. Good morning, Wendy Downey. Um, I am a social studies teacher at Osborne Park High School in Prince William, and I am representing uh, Region 4. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Jones. Morning and salutations to everyone. My name is Jessica Jones. I'm an agricultural education teacher and FFA advisor at Tunstall High School in Pennsylvania County, and we are currently welding, so I will see you all in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jennifer Andrews. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Andrews. I'm a um, sexual education teacher at Mills Godwin High School in Henrico County, and I represent second mm -hmm. special education teachers in Region 1. Thank you. Uh, Diane Stubbins. Nancy Bradley. Uh, I'm Nancy Bradley and I'm citizen at large and I'm a professor of elementary education at Virginia Tech. Thank you. Uh, Andy Cox. Good morning, I'm Andy Cox. I'm the director of the teacher education program and the department chair at the University of Virginia's College at Wise. It's nice to see everybody this morning. Thank you. Sarah Gross. Good morning, I'm Sarah Gross. Um, I am the immediate past president of Virginia PTA. I live in Richmond City and um, I love being here um, and I'm the parent representative. Thank you. Thank you. Travis Burns. Good morning, Travis Burns, principal Northumberland High School in Northumberland, Virginia. 
and I also represent the principals as the immediate past president of the Virginia Association of Secondary School Principals. Thank you. Cardell Patillo. Good morning. My name is Cardell Patillo. I serve as a member of the Virginia, uh, the board directors for the Virginia School Board Association and also vice chair of the Portsmouth School Board. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, Jennifer McClellan, good morning and welcome. Good morning. I am uh, Senator Jennifer McClellan. I represent the 9th Senate District, which is parts of the city of Richmond, Henrico, uh, Hanover, the town of Ashland, and all of Charles City County, and a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Thank you. Uh, Skylar Van Valkenburg. Good morning. My name is Skylar Van Valkenburg. I represent the 72nd District uh, in Western Henrico County in the House of Delegates, uh, which is why I'm officially here, but I'm also, uh, this is my 16th year teaching in Henrico County Public Schools. I teach uh, history and civics, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Monica Ose. She might be on the phone, but. Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're with us, Dr. Ose. Oh, oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Can you, you want to introduce I, yourself? I was like, am I in the Aptel meeting? Did I put these numbers incorrectly? Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Osei with the State Council. Thank you. Um, Dan Lewis. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Dan Lewis, Director of Academic Programs and Policy for the Virginia Community College System. Thank you so much. Patty. Good morning. I'm Patty Pitts. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Teacher Education and Licensure at the Department of Education. Welcome. Tara. Good morning, everybody. Happy early Christmas, holidays. <laughs> Director of Teacher Ed with the Virginia Department of Education with Patty. And uh, Maggie. Good morning, I'm Maggie Clemens. I'm the Director of Licensure and School Leadership here at the Department of Education. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nancy Walsh. I'm the Director for Professional Practices at the Department of Education. I work closely with Patty and Maggie and Tara. Good morning, Charlotta. Would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. My name is Charlotta Williams. I am a fourth grade teacher representing Norfolk Public Schools. Um, let me go back. Just, has Tracy arrived? Um, Tracy just sent me a message. She was yeah. checking to see if I was on, but she didn't say anything else. Okay, thank you. How about Selena? Uh, excuse me, Patricia. Uh, this yes, is Steve. Uh, I talked with Tracy. She's having some difficulties, but she's trying to get on. Okay, thank you. And I just sent her the link again. Okay. okay. Um, Selena Dickey or Mary McIntyre? As I mentioned, we have a number of guests and in a little bit, we'll hear from uh, our Virginia Teacher of the Year. We also um, have um, Malik McKinley from ETS who will be presenting. Have I missed anyone? Peggy? Yes, good morning. Peggy Schimler, I'm the Director of the Education Department at Randolph College and I represent higher ed's private institution. I am so sorry, Peggy. I don't know how I skipped you. <laughs> Good morning. That's okay. Good morning. All right. The first order of business is the approval of the agenda, which was sent to you. Are there any comments or discussion? Do I have a motion to approve? This is Nancy Welch. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Thank you, Nancy. Is there a second? Second, second, Jennifer Andrews. Um, second, Jennifer Andrews, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The agenda is approved. Next on the list is the approval of the minutes. Uh, there are a couple of things I need to mention first. Um, um, Cardell Patillo was marked absent and he was present. So that will be um, amended. 
And um, the other thing that you should know is that the meeting was not recorded due to some technology issues. So please check the attendance membership and make sure that your name is on the list and that we do not need to make corrections there. Are there any and other corrections? Tricia? Yes, Patty. On motions, due to the fact that we are doing this in a public forum, we will need to do a roll call vote on motions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Do you want me to go back to the agenda? We probably should, yes. yes. Okay. Can, can I do the agenda in the minutes together? Probably not. <laughs> um, I'll go back, it's fine. Yeah, I think the minutes might be different because there's a correction. Correction, okay. Uh -huh. Well, how about we, we finish with the minutes and then I'll go back to the agenda. Sure. All right, are there any other corrections to the minutes? Is there a motion to approve the minutes as corrected? Move for approval, Cardell Patillo. Thank you, Cardell, is there a second? Second, Jessica. Yep. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna um, take a roll here. So um, Andrew Dare. Approved. Thank you, Nancy Welch. Yes. Gary Carter. Aye. Uh, uh, Philip Watt. Yes. Arletta Williams. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Steve Witten. Yes. Wendy Downey. Yes. Jessica Jones. Yes. Jennifer Andrews. Yes. Diane Stubbins. Oh. Yes. Thank you. And welcome. Um, Nancy Bradley. Aye. Andy Cox. Aye. Peggy Schimler. Aye. Sarah Gross. Aye. Travis Burns. Yes. Cardell Patillo. Yes. Senator McClellan. Yes. Delegate Van Valkenburg. Yes. Uh, and I vote yes. Did I miss anyone? Thank you. The minutes are approved as corrected. All right, so I apologize for the error before. We need to go back. Um, we had a motion to approve the agenda and a second. So we just need to take a roll call vote. So um, Andrew Dare. Yes. Nancy Welch. Yes. Gary Carter. Aye. Philip Watt. Yes. Charletta Williams. Yes. Steve Witten. Yes. Wendy Downing. Yes. Jessica Jones. Yes. Jennifer Andrews. Yes. Diane Stubbins. Yes. Nancy Bradley. Aye. Andy Cox. Aye. Peggy Schimler. Aye. Sarah Gross. Aye. Travis Burns. Aye. Cardell Patillo. Yes. Senator McClellan. Yes. Delegate Van Valkenburg. Yes. Yes, and I vote aye as well. Thank you all for Tracy Mercier. I'm on the call now. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. No worries. Would you introduce yourself quickly, please? Good morning. I'm Tracy uh, Mercier from Bristol, Virginia, down near the Tennessee line. And we are having in-person and remote learning. So um, I'm in my classroom and um, I look forward to working with everyone today. And thank you for letting me join you. And again, I apologize for being late. Thank you. All right, uh, there were no public comments submitted uh, today, so we can move past that to the updates uh, from Patty. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, good morning everyone, and welcome to our legislators. It's so nice to have you on Abtel this year. For in October, there were a couple of items that we submitted to the Board of Education from Abtel. The first was the final approval of new endorsement programs. And I thank Tara and her team for all the work that they did on that um, initiative. And the Board of Education approved 
um, that item for final review in October. So all those programs have now been approved and thank you for Aptel's work in reviewing those. Also, as you will recall, we went over in detail the amendments to the licensure regulations, approved program regulations, and guidelines for hearings, and submitted to the Board of Education those revisions to comport with primarily 2020 legislation. However, in the area of reprimands, um, it included 2019 and 2020 legislation. So we went over those in detail last time, so I won't do that again today, but that, that um, item will go to the Board of Education for final review this month. There were no questions um, from the Board of Education. Nancy did a great job explaining the reprimands and all of these revisions will go through the fast track. So we anticipate that they will um, go through pretty quickly. I do want to call your attention to one item that the Board of Education did hear at its last meeting. Actually, it will be hearing for the third time in November, even though it is not specific to any Aptel recommendation or your specific work. But I think it's important for you to know that the Board of Education is reviewing the process to certify the list of individuals who are eligible for appointment as division superintendent. Now, the way this came about was that in looking at the constitution, the constitution does require that the Board of Education must certify to the school board of each division, persons who are qualified for the office of division superintendent. Now, prior to 1993, the way this was done was that we did not have any kind of license, and back then we called them certificates, for individuals to serve as a division superintendent. So what was done was that the board received every month a list of individuals who met the criteria that the board set forth to be appointed a division superintendent. In 1993, the Board of Education approved a license, a division superintendent license, for several reasons. One, it was very complicated when people went to other states. No other state used what they called a certified list, which was very confusing. So we started issuing the division superintendent license. When that happened, no longer did the board require us to bring a list of individuals to them to certify for appointment. So the list of certified individuals is really composed of those individuals who have a division superintendent license. Well, in looking at that, the Board of Education is concerned that it probably should be certifying the list each month. And there's been a lot of discussion. There has been some concern. One is about the timeline that it takes for the board to certify. As you know, the board doesn't meet every single month. And the way this works currently is that if an individual applies for a division superintendent license, many times they or the um, agency or company that's working with the school board or a school board member might communicate with me and said and would say would you please expedite this application if you overnight it to me and I will say sure and then they receive their division superintendent license and the school board can move forward to appoint the individual in that position. With this new process and depending how the board approves it and what the procedure will be is that individuals would need to wait until that list was certified. But all of this is still up in discussion. So at the last board meeting, the board members asked if the Virginia School Boards Association, who I had already communicated with once, would 
look at this and give us any kind of recommendations because they had expressed two concerns. One, the length of time that it may take to get one on the list, and two, a confidentiality issue. Now, you all know that if one holds a license, you can go to the public query on our website and you can put in a person's name and it will tell you what type of license the person holds and when that license expires. So we're all used to that, public query. But when someone applies for a division superintendent license, they will apply and then we would issue the division superintendent license out of my office, the individual receives it. The concern is that if an individual, say from out of state, is an applicant for a position, let's just say division A has a vacancy and all of a sudden in the next few weeks, you see the Board of Education approving a list of names. And it could be that someone's from out of state and one could start looking at those lists and say, oh, now I know that that person applied because perhaps that person is applying for a division superintendency. So it just becomes a little bit more public. So in the board item, which has already been posted and you can read it in its entirety if this is of interest to you, the Virginia School Boards Association has recommended, made four recommendations to the Board of Education. Now again, the board will hear this item on Thursday of this week and certainly you can listen to that if this is of interest to you. But they're recommending that Board of Education members who are employed by local school board should not be given information about applicants from their own school divisions. They're also indicating that names of applicants should be kept confidential until approved by the board. So in other words, um, I think what they're saying is that if um, an item is posted on the website, and you know, board materials become available a week or two before that those um, names be kept confidential until approved by the board. Third, the Board of Education should commit to an expedited process to approve applications within seven days when necessary for the school board to appoint its preferred candidate. And last, the SBA is recommending a change in the Constitution of Virginia that removes the process of requiring the board to certify a list of qualified individuals for local school boards to choose as applicants to hire as school superintendents. Now, these are just recommendations that the board will review and consider, but um, this item has not been uh, resolved. The board has taken no action on it yet, but we anticipate that there could be action this week on Thursday. And I just wanted to let you know, because many times you are the first folks to get these kind of questions. And I just wanted you to be aware of that item. Um, the other two we had gone over in much detail. So before I move on to the uniform performance standards, are there any questions regarding the board items? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna move on to an update on the revision of the uniform performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers. It's very exciting that we are in the process of looking at the performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers and we are revising those now. As you know, our system began in about 1999, 2000, when we developed our performance standards and the board approved a uniform system that school divisions could use exactly as presented or they could adapt those as long as they met the codified requirements for evaluations. And performance standards have to be included in any school board's evaluation system. There were some additional revisions in 2012. That was a pretty comprehensive revision of those performance standards. And we also um, in 2015 revised them. That was a smaller change or a minor change in that 
we move from using student growth percentiles to progress tables. And in 2020, January of this year, the seven performance standards for teachers were reviewed and the weightings of those were revised by the Board of Education. The Board of Education has recommended or recommended in January that school boards weight the seven standards 1.5 or 15% with the exception of professionalism that would be one or 10% of the evaluation. As you are aware, the, um, we were required to weight student academic progress previously 40%, but that would the recommended weighting is now 1.5 or 15% of the total evaluation. So we're, that was the first step in this process to revise the performance standards. We have engaged the assistance of James Strong and Associates. James Strong has worked with us on each of these revisions, primarily the one in 1999 and 2012 in this one. Um, and he is working with us again. We have 20 some folks who are on this work group and Trisha Store Hunt is on the work group, Nancy Bradley and Nancy Welch, all from Aptel. Now they represent um, superintendency, higher education, um, but they are, those three on Aptel, I don't think there's anyone else from Aptel on the group, but we do have three. We have, um, like I said, we have teachers, superintendents, central office. We have major associations, um, Virginia Federation of Teachers, the VEA, um, VAS, all the major organizations are part of this group. They have met once. And at this time, it looks like they're going in the direction of adding one additional performance standard, which would be the, um, and, and wording could be changed. They have met once and have a document that they're reviewing now to get back to us with revisions. But at this point, um, what they are using as a draft for the eighth standard is culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices. So I wanted to let you know that they are doing this work and we probably will not make a recommendation on the renewal requirements until we know what those standards will be because the renewal system and the performance standards um, do need to be aligned. So that's the work we're, we're doing and certainly you can communicate with me. And like I said, you have three individuals who are working on the work group. And if you'd like the entire list, you can send me an email and I'll be glad to do that. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Tricia, unless we have questions. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate the update. Um, as I mentioned, we are very excited to have our 2021 Virginia Teacher of the Year with us. I'm going to turn it over to Tara so that she can introduce him. Good morning, everyone. I do not want to stand between you and Anthony because he is just, I don't know, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, he is from Franklin County. He was our Region 6 Teacher of the Year, and he teaches fifth grade at Rocky Mount Elementary School. You guys are going to get to hear all about um, how he came about the, the calling that he has for being a teacher, and it is a true calling. And he will convey that to you um, through his passion and his dedication. And um, he's just, you, you really, you're in for a treat today. So as we always do this time of year, um, no further ado, Mr. Anthony Swan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to be on this call with you all. Um, 
As she stated, my name is Anthony Swan, and I have the distinct honor of serving as the 2021 Virginia Teacher of the Year. Um, I'm excited to be able to serve on such a platform as this. Um, my teaching career began in July of 2007, and um, I began teaching at Schoolfield Elementary in Danville, Virginia. Um, teaching here, uh, teaching at that school was actually one of the very first hurdles that I conquered. Um, the reason being is because uh, when I was younger, I attended the same elementary school, um, Schoolfield Elementary. And while I was there, um, I distinctly remember sitting in my fourth grade classroom um, with my fourth grade teacher as she was teaching and there was a knock on the door. Um, and that knock changed uh, my life forever. Um, who was at the door, you may ask? It was social services. Um, I was taken away to a foster home in the middle of the school day um, while sitting in my classroom. And um, as they knocked on the door and as they told my teacher that they had to take me, um, I felt humiliated, I felt embarrassed, um, I felt crushed. Um, but before my teacher allowed them to take me, she grabbed me and she hugged me and she said, Anthony, everything is gonna be all right. Um, just last week, I had the distinct honor of being with her and interviewing her. And for the very first time, I heard the story of how she found me. You see, I stayed in foster care until I was uh, 21 years old. And um, she actually made it her duty to find me. She found me when I was like um, 11 years old. And she began to tell me and she said, Anthony, I want you to grow up to be somebody. Um, I didn't have my father. I've never lived with my father a day in my life. Uh, my mom was a drug addict. My mom was an alcoholic. Um, I distinctly remember times of waking up, seeing her being arrested, um, seeing her in the streets. Um, so that was very traumatic. And so she just said, Anthony, I want you to grow up to be somebody. I want you to grow up to be something. And so it was then at the age of 11 that I decided that I wanted to be a teacher. And so I poured all my anger and all my frustration and all my uh, feelings of rejection from my parents. I began to play school every single day. Monday through Sunday, I played school every single day because it was my way of escape, of feeling rejection from my parents. And so as years progress, uh, my fourth grade teacher continued to follow me and she told me to put myself into my studies. And so I did that. And um, as I got to college, I had to put my own self through college because I didn't have parents. And uh, I distinctly remember her when I did my student teaching, she got up early before she had to be at school. She got up early and she would pick me up and take me to my student teaching placements to make sure that I got there on time. Um, to this day, she still calls me and she said, Anthony, I told you everything was gonna be all right. And so that gave me the love for children that I have, because I want them to be able to experience the love from a male's perspective that I never experienced. And so since I've been teaching in 2007, here's some of the things that I've incorporated in my classroom. First of all, I always tell my students my story. I let them know where I come from because I want them to know that no matter how bad your situation may look, if you're experiencing trauma at home, that you can grow up to make something of yourself. So I always share my story with them. Since I've been teaching every single Christmas, I, I tell my children to write down five things that they want for Christmas and I buy one thing off of that list. I wrap it up and we open up gifts before they get out for Christmas. Ever since I've been teaching, I've done that because I want them to realize that if you don't get anything, you at least get, got that one thing from Mr. Swan. Since I've been teaching, I've made home visits to um, some of the boys in my class that have experienced trauma. Some of the boys in my class um, who are lacking uh, a male figure. 
And I distinctly remember a couple of years ago when I was still teaching in Danville, um, a mom, a single mom texted me and she texted me and she said, Mr. Swan, I want to tell you, thank you for saving my son's life. She said, since he's been in your class, he's been using great manners at home. I don't have to beg him to do his chores. He's very respectful. I want to tell you, thank you for saving my son's life. Um, since I've been teaching as well, I started incorporating, well, I started the program at Rocky Mount Elementary called Guys With Ties. I started this about two years ago. And what we distinctly do is we have, we wear a tie, but we talk about things like honesty. We talk about things like respect. We talk about things like integrity. One issue that I hit with the boys uh, this last year is cleanliness because most guys, most boys feel like that it's a woman's job to stay clean and a woman's job to um, do certain things. And so I'm, I want to instill in them life lessons as well. I remember one of my students saying, well, when I get older, I'm gonna have a wife and I'm not gonna have to do all of these things. And so I wanted to instill in them, no, you're going to have to help your wife along the way. And so um, we did a service project where we went around the school and we helped the custodians collect the trash um, throughout the school day because I wanted them to know that it is okay to be a male and to be clean as well. Another pro service project that we did is because I wanted them to learn how to treat a lady, we gave every single girl in the school a carnation and a bag of chocolate um, last Valentine. Um, and we, we delivered that throughout the school um, because I wanted them to know that how to treat a lady. And we had community members, we had parents, we had grandparents there that day. And it really made uh, some of the females day. Um, I said all that to say this, I simply love teaching. Not only do I look at myself as a teacher, I look at myself as a servant, right? Because a servant does things behind the scenes. A servant doesn't do anything to be seen. A servant also knows specifically the needs of individuals so that they can serve those individuals. And so that's how I look at myself. Not only do I teach my children, but I want to serve my children on a daily basis. I'm very open with them. Um, if I'm having a bad day, I communicate with my children because I want them to know that it's safe in my classroom to communicate with me that if you're having a bad day, so Mr. Swan will know how to handle you. Mr. Swan will know how to get you the help that you need. And so they find my room as a safe haven. I'll share this one last story. Um, two years ago, I had a foster child in my room. And that's my soft spot because I was in foster care until I was age 21. And after sharing my story, he began to share things with me. He began to open up with me. But the last day of school, um, him and I began to shed tears together because we realized that we would not see, see each other anymore. And um, his foster mother came back and shared with me. She said, you know, Mr. Swan, on up into the hours of the night, he was just crying. And we asked him, what, what was the case? Why, why are you still crying? And he shared with her, he said, I'll never get to see Mr. Swan again. But to give him the inspiration that um, he can grow up to be someone no matter what is going on. And since then, he's emailed me. He's tried to stay in contact with me. Um, even with the Guys with Ties program, one of the guys that uh, is in the middle school contacted me this year and he said, hey, Mr. Swan, I hear that you're doing Guys with Ties over Zoom this year. I still want to be a part of that program. Now, just, just for him to say that lets me know that, hey, I'm making a difference. And so my, I just want children to know that they have hope and they have a chance to go somewhere in life, no matter the situation, no matter how dark it may seem, brighter days are coming. Um, and so I want to serve as a beacon of hope for them uh, this year. And I also want the teachers to know that their voice has the ability to change a child's life. It was my fourth grade teacher's voice 
that I distinctly remember in my in my head saying, Mr. Swan, well, she said, Anthony, you can be something and you can make something of yourself. And I'm so glad that I took her words and I ran with them and I did not get caught in the justice system. So I'm Anthony Swan and I'm so honored to be able to serve as the Virginia Teacher of the Year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. You probably can't see us all clapping and celebrating you, but thank you for sharing your very inspiring story with us today. We so appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right. All right, moving on. You're a hard act to follow, Anthony. <laughs> We are up to uh, agenda item one, and that means uh, we are going to be looking at a recommendation for a passing score for the Praxis Middle School Science Test. And we are very excited to have Malik McKinley, the Director of Client Relations for, uh, from ETS with us. He is our new state representative, though not new to uh, ETS, just new to Virginia. Um, Tara, are you going to introduce and, and begin this piece or Patty? It will be me. Okay, thank you, Patty. But I would be remiss if I didn't say something to Anthony. Anthony, you are so inspirational and what you do for children in the Commonwealth um, is, is to be commended. I am so happy that you are our Virginia Teacher of the Year and the message of hope that you will give to children all across the Commonwealth. Um, you are just a role model for teachers across the nation. So thank you for your work. Thank you for what you do for our, our children. We very much appreciate it. You are just awesome. It's hard to put in words how wonderful you are, but awesome is, is the word that comes to mind this morning. So thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony, do you have a minute or two? I, a couple of folks have asked if you have time for questions. Patty, do we have a few moments? Sure. To do that. Anthony, would you be willing to answer some questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Andrew, do you want to start? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Swan. That was just absolutely inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm Dean of the School of Education at VCU, and I know we have other um, higher education representatives here. And I imagine that some of my colleagues are probably thinking the same thing. You know, how, how can we recruit people like you? And what, um, what should we be doing differently in our, in our educator preparation programs um, to ensure that that more students have that experience that you had with that teacher that changed your life? Good question. Um, I think that you all are ready to uh, address it. One of the challenges I had while I was in college uh, was passing that praxis. And um, even my senior year, I had taken it three times and still didn't pass. And I think that you all are ready to address like the, the passing rate of the score. And so that would definitely help um, to make sure that children will have someone um, who, is as a, who is as passionate as, as I am um, when it comes down to education. Um, and talking with the individual students as well to see what they need in order to help them to be successful. I'm talking about the college students, like seeing what they need. Cause there were times where, because I did not have the support from my parents or from family that I struggled. There were times where I actually wanted to quit. Um, I, I remember my senior year, my mom passed away out of the blue. And although she wasn't the best mom, you only get one. And I wanted to quit. And had someone not been in my ear pushing me to keep going, I would have quit. I, I would say just uh, being a support to the college students as well to help them to get what they need. 
Thank you. And congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Well, thank you again, Anthony. We are so appreciative of your time and for your sharing your story with us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so we are on to uh, item one and uh, Patty, you are going to introduce this. So I turn it over to you. Thank you, Tricia. This topic is a recommendation for passing score for the Praxis Middle School Science 5442 test for the Middle Education 6 to 8 Science endorsement. And I am pleased to introduce to you Malik McKinley. He is the Director of Client Relations at the Professional Educa Educator Programs Office for Teacher Licensure and Certification, Student and Teacher Assessment Division, that's a mouthful, um, at the Educational Testing Service. He does have a PowerPoint, so um, Maggie, he will need to be able to um, share his screen to show that. But Malik will present to us an overview of the standard setting study. Some of you are very familiar with this process because you have been a part of making recommendations before for praxis assessments. And others of you may not be as familiar. So he's going to go over that process with you, as well as tell you a little bit about the test. Now you might wonder, why are we looking at this test now? As you know, um, we do have licensure assessments that the Board of Education prescribed. They are required to do that by law. And they prescribe the Virginia Communication Literacy Assessment, the VCLA, which is offered through Evaluation Systems Group at Pearson. And then we have the Praxis Subject Assessments, as well as the Reading for Virginia Educators, RVE, for specified endorsements. Today, we're looking at the Middle School Science Test because that test was revised substantially. The revisions were made based upon national standards being revised in the area of science. So whenever there is more than just a tweak to a test, but a substantial revision, a new standard setting study needs to be conducted and Abtel would need to recommend to the Board of Education a passing score. So Malik, I'm gonna turn it over to you so that you can share with us information about this process and a little bit more about the test since you are the expert. All right, thank you very much, Patty. Um, I am going to share my screen. And while he's doing that, let me just say, he has been so responsive. We are very fortunate in Virginia that he is our representative. This is the first time he's presented to Abtel, but I've had the pleasure of working with him for numerous months and he's very responsive and um, we are very, very fortunate, Malik, to have you as our um, client relations representative in Virginia. Thank you very much, Patty. So as we get started, um, as Patty mentioned, we're going to speak about the middle school science exam, 5442. Um, for today's agenda, uh, although there's a lot of items on here, some of these are just uh, screenshots, so please don't be overwhelmed. I'm not going to take too much of your time this morning, just uh, you know, five or ten minutes or so. Um, I, I Just in terms of, of level setting, I'm assuming everybody is aware of, uh, of ETS and who we are, um, but just in case anyone is, uh, is new to 
um, new to Aptel or new to understanding about uh, ETS, we are an organization, a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1947. Our overall mission is to advance quality and equity and education for all people worldwide. Um, everything that we do from the development of an exam to administration, uh, to scoring, to, um, to the research and uncovering the best practices upon that research, all delve back to or all connect to this particular mission. Uh, if you've heard of ETS, you're aware that we, we uh, administer the SAT and AP exams at the high school level, as well as the GRE exam. TOEFL, TOEIC, a number of a number of programs here at ETS, uh, but specifically we're talking about um, the Praxis program or the Professional Educator program today. Uh, in terms of Praxis, in terms of Praxis exams, uh, we offer Praxis tests in thirty plus states around the nation, including some territories, um, some U.S. territories. We offer the Praxis Core exam, which is a basic skills test, as well as Praxis Two tests, which are subject knowledge exams, as well as um, well, content knowledge exams, as well as uh, pedagogical exams. So the exam we're talking about today is middle school science. But I just wanted to take you through the test development process real quickly. As Patty mentioned, um, when when um, new standards come about and, and new standards have been released for the area of science in general over the last uh, last several years, uh, we take a look at the exam that's in place and then kind of walk through this test development cycle that you see here on screen. So in, in 30 seconds or less, as you can see here, we start with a national advisory committee. And what we do there is bring together experts in the field, whether that be faculty members or K through 12 teachers, uh, experts and, and researchers that are that have a, a depth of knowledge across the nation. We bring them together at ETS and then begin to look at the standards. If standards have changed, we talk about those standards. Our assessment development department talks about those standards. And then they kind of build toward or, or scaffold toward that job analysis survey. So we, we begin to build the, the knowledge and skill statements that are important to the field. What is most important as we look at these standards in terms of how we are going to assess whether a candidate understands uh, understands that material? In the job analysis survey, we pull together hundreds of uh, knowledge and skills statements, and we send that out to teachers across the nation. And we ask for teachers to kind of respond to those knowledge and skills statements and let us know. Uh, what is most important here? Do you feel like this particular statement is important and should be reflected in the exam? So as we move on from that process, it comes back to ETS. We, we calculate those results and then we pull together the National Advisory Committee one more time to look at the survey and then continue on in terms of the, the foundation of the exam. As we move into number four here, test specifications, um, that's where we kind of really build out the test. So what you're, for folks that are familiar with the Praxis program, uh, you know, once we get to the creation of a test at a glance, that's where we have knowledge and skill statements and we have overarching categories. Those overarching categories are then broken down into bulleted and numbered and lettered points. And all of that is a part of the test specification process. We move from there into test formation where we have internal writers and then we also have external test um, testing experts that come together to develop in individual items based on the test specifications. As we form uh, multiple, multiple test forms of, uh, of a particular academic discipline, then we move into the standard setting process as well as the test administration process. Um, if you have any questions, please, please let me know. With the standard setting process, and we're going to dive into it in just a bit, um, what we do once we have um, once we have the test in place, we develop the first form, and then we use that form to guide the standard setting process. So our assessment assessment development team comes together. Uh, we reach out to multiple states, and sometimes this happens on a state by state basis, depending on the prerogative of the state. But over the last ten years, uh, most states have wanted to come together. Um, and, and speak with each other about, um, about a particular exam. So for example, with, with science or with any subject area, we'll pull together, we'll reach out to departments of education as well as agencies of education across the nation, ask them to share with us 
uh, some experts in this particular field. So uh, we'll reach out to Patty and ask Patty, can you share with us a few names that are a few teachers or faculty members that are focused in, in a particular academic discipline? Someone that you would recommend it, someone that you would trust to participate in this process. They come up to ETS for about three days and they receive some initial training from our assessment development team to understand that they're going to look at each individual item. Not only they're going to look at the test specifications as well as the test at a glance, um, as well as have some uh, additional uh, material to look at, but they're going to look at each individual item. So say, for example, a test uh, form has 120 items. With those 120 items, we're going to provide the item, we're going to provide the answer choices, we're going to provide the correct answer, and then a candidate and then a participant is going to look at that and judge whether that particular question is, uh, in, in layman terms, uh, an easy question, uh, a moderately difficult question or extremely difficult question. And as they provide, as they provide those particular judgments, uh, those judgments are then calculated in assessment to produce a recommending passing score. I will note, we pull together again, multiple states as a part of that process. So the recommendation that you'll see today is not from ETS. It, it is, it's facilitated by ETS, but it truly represents the practitioner's judgment um, and you'll see the folks that participate in, in just a moment. And then we take that particular uh, material, we put it into a study, and then we share that with states across the nation. So with the adoption process, uh, some states walk through a test review, specifically looking at the exam. They look at the study report, which is what we'll do today. Um, this test is, is uh, fairly new, so there's not much data, but... Um, um, so some states look at data, they make decisions within the department or the agency of education, and then obviously move on to the board for final discussions. Uh, and then notification goes out to education preparation programs across, across the state. So specifically with, with science, we are redesigning all of our praxis uh, science exams, aligning them to uh, next generation science standards, as, uh, NSTA sci uh, standards as well. Um, you'll see in just a moment, we have incorporated the tasks of teaching science as well as science and engineering practices as a part of the middle school test as, and as well as a part of uh, other exams that we are in the process of regenerating. Uh, when we decided to look at uh, all of our science exams from elementary to high school, we brought together 67 educators from 34 states to have some conversations about science. In terms of the regeneration of science exams, as you can see at the top, we're talking about middle school science today. So we went through the standard setting process um, at the end of last year, and it has been available from September of this year onward. Uh, this is the exam that has been um, th that's been regenerated. As Patty mentioned, uh, middle school science um, had been in place for a number of years. Obviously, with standards changing, we wanted to make sure that the content on the middle school science test reflected the updated standards that are being adopted um, by states across the nation. But just to give you a, um, just a picture here, you can see other exams that, have, that are going through the, the updating process and that will be released in September 21. Uh, and, and onward, you see general science, biology, chemistry, earth and space science, a number of exams that Virginia uses. So with the study companion, this is a free guide that helps uh, not only faculty members, but also helps students become familiar with an exam. So with middle school science, you'll find uh, sample questions, you'll find uh, content, and let's just kind of dive into it real quickly here. The middle school science test is a, a 150 minute exam. There are 125 questions on this test. The content categories, as you can see here, are, are listed. Uh, nature and impact of science and engineering, physical science, uh, life science, and earth and space science. As you can see, the approximate number of questions as well as the percentage of the exam helps that examinee to be able to process and, and study accordingly. Beyond this, within the test at a glance, we also have those overarching categories broken down. So as you can see here, category one uh, is broken down into a lettered point and then moved and then broken down further so that uh, both faculty and candidates can, can truly understand exactly what is to be expected on the exam. 
As I mentioned, um, we, we've captured eight science and engineering principles. They are listed in our test at a glance, so candidates will, will understand that um, there's going to be some material um, that, that integrate these principles into the questions. Beyond that, we also have um, at least seven tasks of teaching science associated with this exam. So questions here will measure the content through the application of these tasks that are listed. And we also provide those tasks as well, as you can see here. And again, this is, this is free information that's found on our website for the candidate that is preparing to take this exam. Beyond that, as I mentioned, um, on the onset of the conversation about tests at a glance, we also have sample test questions. Um, we have maybe 20 to 25 questions per test at a glance. So within the middle school science, um, within the middle school science test, you will see about 25 questions. They have answers as well as rationales associated. So a candidate can really start the foundation of study uh, with this test at a glance. Obviously, it can't be the total sum of a candidate's study, but they can begin to look at how questions are presented by using uh, the sample test questions that are on our website. I know it's a little tough to see here, but uh, here's just a quick screenshot of answers and rationales as to why one answer is better than uh, or more appropriate than another. So real quickly here with the standard setting process, and then I will, I will get out of your way. Um, as, um, as you saw earlier, we did host uh, the standard setting in December. The study was released in January of this year. We had 17 states across the nation and uh, also Washington, D.C. participate in this study. Every state has an opportunity to participate. It depends on whether they have the availability to send candidates, uh, to send participants to, um, um, to New Jersey uh, to participate. Obviously, um, ETS pays for all of that, uh, for the travel and the participation of individual participants, but sometimes states opt out. We had 17 states and Washington DC participate here. There were 31 panelists uh, total on this multi-state standard setting study. Um, the panelists include all of the states that are listed on screen, and you will also see two, um, I just wanted to highlight very quickly, two candidates, two participants from Virginia, one from Wyatt Middle School, as well as one from Greensville County Public Schools. So we always like to have as much participation as possible, and it's great that, that uh, Patty was able to, to connect with these two folks and get, get them um, connected with this study that took place because we wanna make sure that each individual state has representation so that they can reach out to those individuals and, and find out you know, what's, that, what's the study process like and, um, you know, and how did you feel about um, the recommendation that was, that was suggested here. So with the recommendation, um, out of a raw score point of 61, and this is on um, this is on uh, out of a total of 100 points, uh, the raw score 61 converts to a 152. There is a there's a slight calculation that takes place in assessment development to move the raw score point of 61 into a 100 to 200 point scale. Um, so in that translation, uh, the number turns into a 152. Uh, on a 100 to 200 point scale. So the recommendation is a 152. Now, obviously states can adopt wherever they like. This is an individual state decision, but the recommendation that came from the study of 31 participants um, was 152. And then lastly, I'll just share that thus far, all, all, all states that use middle school science are in the process of um, going through test reviews, going through standard setting studies, going through adoptions of, of the new middle school science test, just as we're doing today. Um, but the states that have moved thus far are on screen here. Most have adopted the recommendation, which is a 152. But the, as you can see, there is um, at least uh, two, two states that have adopted below that. And I think at least one state that adopted above that. And really that just depends on the individual state needs. Sometimes states look at a particular exam uh, or a particular, actually a particular academic discipline and decide, you know what, we don't have enough teachers entering in to this particular field. And um, because of that, we want to 
create less stringent um, uh, cut scores so that we can have more teachers enter into the field. Um, and then sometimes there's an overpopulation of teachers in a particular field and states decide, you know what, we've got too many uh, ex uh, teachers. Um, so in that case, they may set the score higher, but it really just depends on the state and, and the direction um, the state wants to go in. But I would, I would, I would share that since we brought the multi-state study process um, um, to states, most states do adopt at the recommended study value, and this one is 152. All right, and then lastly, I just wanted to share with the test administration process, um, many of our exams are in two week windows across months. So month after month, uh, a candidate will be able to take, uh, take an exam in a two week window. And, um, and, and that gives them that, that opportunity to take that test. As you all know, or um, as I believe you all are aware, we have brought together uh, the at-home testing process or solution to the Praxis program. And this gives all, um, all uh, test takers an opportunity uh, to take a test at home. So if they have a, a secure environment at home where they can close the door, they have a computer, they have internet access, and they have a couple hours to spare to take the exam, uh, we'll, we'll connect with them through uh, a third party vendor, uh, ProctorU, to offer this test at home. The test is the same price as if, um, as if a candidate took it in, in a actual physical testing center. Um, and it, it is just as secure because we have monitors that are that are um, observing candidates as they're taking exams. But the test is the exact same, but it just gives the individual candidate that comfort, especially in pandemic times uh, when uh, some students are, are concerned or nervous or so fearful about going out and in, about in, into the community. It gives them an opportunity to take that test at home in a secure place. Um, where they don't feel like they're putting themselves at risk. So we brought this to the market in May of this year, and we have recently shared um, with all states that this is going to be the new normal for the Praxis program. So all exams um, are going to be moved into this format, but I just wanted to let you know that middle school science is already in this particular format, so, um, uh, so candidates can at this point take this test at home. And um, that's it for my brief presentation. If anyone wants to get in contact with me, I, I work with Patty all the time. A delight to work with in Virginia. But my email address is mmckinley at ets.org. And I'm here to support uh, faculty members, uh, those who work with candidates, as well as your individual teacher candidates if they ever need, um, need any help or extra support from me. Thank you. Thank you, Malik. Um, does anyone have questions for, for Malik about the process or this recommended score? I had one question. Sure, Diane, uh, go ahead. We're an uh, independent school and our teachers don't always have licensing. If our teachers were to take this test after they're already employed as teachers for us, who would see those scores like could we arrange for us to see it or would that be just the private teacher would see it or who who would would be able to access those scores if we had our teachers take these just to assess them you mean after they have officially left the university oh uh, yes okay so so the candidate receives a score and that's that's free of charge then they have additionally four um, four score reports that they can send to anyone in the nation. Obviously, that's a that's a receiver of scores. So one will go to the candidate. One will automatically go to the Department of Education, and then the candidate will have um, four free score reports to go to anyone. So if he or she wants to send one directly to your university, that's their prerogative. Um, but I, I imagine you would probably have to do that outreach with the individual candidate to let them know to choose you as a, as a score recipient. Mm -hmm. But if these are students who are, these are young adults who already have their degrees, and I just wanted to test their field knowledge in a particular field, um, does th that score have to go to the State Department of Education if they're not applying for licensure? 
The I believe Virginia is in, in most states in the nation are automatic reporting states, which means if a candidate takes a test in the state, it automatically goes to the department. Okay. Thank so you. There, there isn't any way around that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Just a follow up question uh, with regard to testing in general. So it's my understanding that the praxis all praxis assessments, including the praxis two assessments, can be administered remotely. Is 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 that accurate? So we have currently about seventy of the ninety plus exams um, in this at home testing solution, uh, and we're working toward adding more. So I can't completely confirm that every single exam, for example, world languages, are not yet in this solution because we're trying to work out uh, some details around how to how to capture um, candidates' voice and and how to how to play recordings, et cetera. So there are a few exams that are still not in the solution, but um, I, I would venture to guess about 80% of what Virginia uses is already in our at-home testing solution, including um, for those who, who work with uh, paraprofessionals or, or are in contact with paraprofessionals on any level. We are, um, as of January, late January, early February, going to be going to allow paraprofessionals to also take it take that exam at home as well. So uh, most exams are in this format and we're going to be moving toward adding more, uh, but the majority of exams, uh, over 80% of our exams are already in this format. Thank you. And I know this wasn't necessarily part of your presentation, but but Patty, uh, if you could maybe address, you know, I know that we, you know, in the when the pandemic hit, we, we granted a lot of extensions and reprieves for teachers who were unable to to test, does, does this play into that variable in terms of expectations for teachers getting their, their praxis, praxis tests you know, scheduled and underway given that they now can take the test remotely? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. It certainly has been helpful for individuals to be able to take the test at home and we know that many individuals have. Um, individuals do need to have the proper equipment to be able to do that. Um, we have not really discussed at this point exceptions for the following year, but yes, for this past year, we have granted extensions of licenses, even for renewal, which really doesn't have anything to do specific to the test and also given one-year licenses to individuals who have held provisional licenses to give them another year of grace. That is in addition to the two extensions allowed by law if certain um, conditions are met. So we will be looking um, again at those as we move forward. But for now, we for this year, we do have waivers or the one-year license in place um, for individuals. But we are hopeful that most teachers, if they can get it at home, will. The RVE though, the Reading for Virginia Educators is not um, one that they can take at home currently, as well as for world languages and there are a few others. So we do know that that will um, be a problem for teachers until they can be placed um, in the home solution. Malik, I have a technical question. Um, the raw score that we're looking at is 60, 61 out of 100 raw score points. So since the test is 125 questions, does that mean that 25 questions are field tested each time the students take the exam? Right. There's always some questions that um, are not scored, and we don't mark those questions when a candidate takes an exam. Um, so they won't know which ones aren't scored um, and which ones are. But um, there usually are 15, 20 plus questions that are either field testing and we pull them aside to kind of analyze results around that. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, um, I've got a question on, on test development, which um, I'm a quantitative researcher. So I kind of geeked out just a little bit when you were presenting on that. Um, but one, I guess the questions that I have is with test development, I, I think there are many 
that would say that we're missing something with these praxis exams. We, we just heard from our Virginia teacher of the year who, you know, um, you know, stated some of his challenges um, with that test. And, and, and we hear that um, over and over again. And, and we know some of our finest teachers, um, particularly those who are working in our highest need schools with our students and poverty with our underrepresented minority students, tends to be the ones who are struggling more on that praxis exam and so I'm curious, how is ETS looking into this or what is ETS doing to address this in their test development? So in the test development process, one of the things that we, we make sure of in our test development process is making sure that um, diversity is a core component of um, not only the development process, but also the study examination process. So when we are, when we're creating or developing the multi-state study process and pulling together participants, we're making sure that diversity is a core component. Um, diversity, not only in terms of ethnicity, but also in terms of gender, in terms of geographical location, uh, in terms of, um, of, of age of teaching in, in, in terms of having new teachers as well as seasoned teachers as a part of that process. So we wanna make sure that we're pulling together, the purpose is to make sure that we're pulling together as many perspectives as possible, not only in the development of the exams, um, but also in the multi-state standard setting process. So that's just one way that we try to ensure that all voices are heard um, in the development of test questions, uh, or testing items, as well as in um, the actual judgments that are made about individual testing items when we get to the multi-state study process. That's that's fantastic to hear. And and, and just one follow-up question: um, Are are there specific um, things that you all are doing, or specific? Um, I want to use the word standards, but not to confuse with standards, but you know, are, are, are there some standards that you all are, th that's guiding the test development in the area of cultural responsiveness? Like how is cultural responsiveness guiding the test development process? So at this point, so over the last few years, we've had several um, conversations around cultural responsive teaching um, practices at, at ETS or specifically in the Praxis program. And, we've, and we have researchers currently um, on staff that are delving deeper into how we should incorporate um, cultural responsive practices in our exams. Um, we are in the process of um, thinking about that and kind of taking that particular lens as we look at um, as we look at praxis tests. Um, one example is we have a performance assessment, um, the praxis performance assessment for teachers, which is uh, which is a performance assessment that has four tasks where candidates um, are interacting with students during the student teaching experience and have a video that's recorded at the very end. When we looked at that particular exam, we wanted to start with that exam because there's the interaction with students there. Um, and we began to revise um, tasks. We began to revise the first task of that particular assessment um, to reflect culturally responsive teaching language um, and, and to really start to get a candidates um, thinking about um, what it means to be culturally responsive in the classroom. So we're beginning to think about that. We have incorporated again that in um, one of our exams, PPAT, that obviously that's not something that Virginia uses, but I just wanted to give you an example of how we're thinking about that now. Um, and then we're also in discussions about how um, culturally responsive um, practices can be uh, positioned in um, other praxis exams. So you have to kind of stay tuned for, for more information around that. But that is something that ETS is actively thinking about, actively engaged in, in terms of conversations, not only internally, but externally with, um, with experts across the nation. And that's something that we'll be looking forward to in the future uh, iterations of the praxis program. So, um, and, and I'm, 
I'm not wanting to 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 sound overly critical towards you, Malik, because I know you're reporting this information, but I do have to be honest that it does concern me that ETS, when you say it's beginning to think about this. Um, so, you know, however um, you can communicate with your colleagues, you know, we're we're at a sense of a, a great sense of urgency around this issue not just in educator preparation, but um, really in that, not, not even just the pipeline, but just the gate to get into teaching. And um, I do hope that, that, that this is an area that um, ETS can really just jump in feet first because we're, it's, I mean, it's too late for a lot of kids. And, and that's what kind of concerns me the most. And, and, and when I say kids, both school children and not to infantilize our college students, but you know, for our young adults who are wanting to go into education that this major, like one of the most important gates, which is passing praxis is beginning to think about cultural responsiveness is just very, very concerning to me. And I apologize, Malik, please know I'm, I'm not trying to be negative towards you, but just, I think that's an honest criticism for ETS if they're just beginning to really think about cultural responsiveness. So I, I, I please encourage you all to lean quickly and significantly more heavily into that area because it's an immediate crisis right now, particularly in our hardest to staff schools. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Are there other questions for Malik? Um, so we need to have a discussion. Sure, about it's Tracy, yes. I have a question, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Thank you, I'm sorry. My internet um, connection showing up unstable, so I may have missed something in glitches. Um, if a student, you said the field test items are um, ungraded, does that mean they're ungraded period? Say for example, if um, a person answered all the field test items correctly, but missed some of the main items, would they still get a raw score enough to pass the test? And I'm sorry if that was addressed, I kept glitching, my apologies. Yes, the, there's certainly enough uh, items on the exam for a candidate to to um, to still pass the exam. Um, if a candidate, um, uh, we, we encourage all candidates to respond to each question. And even if they don't um, know the answer, take a, you know, a one in four, one in five guess, because there's a possibility of getting that answer correct. Uh, and if they do answer correctly, um, obviously that will build towards the score. And if they answer incorrectly, then um, it will not hurt their score. Um, it will not count against their particular score. So every, every time they answer a question correctly, it does build toward their score. But um, yes, it, in, in all testing, you know, there are field items that are not associated with the score. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. Thank Anyone you, else? Tricia? Yes, Patty. Did someone else have a question? Then I think Andy did. Go ahead. Uh, Malik, uh, this is uh, Andy Cox from UVA WISE. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. You cleared up a lot of things and uh, really helped me. Um, do, does ETS release any kind of preliminary results on, as you all are field testing um, this, this test, for example, the, the middle school science, um, are any of those results um, available in terms of, you know, breakdowns on race and gender and ethnicity? Um, uh, is any of that uh, available to us? So in terms of overall scores, um, the department as well as each university has access to overall pass rate, passing uh, rate data. And, um, and you can break that down using any demographic that you want, whether that be gender, ethnicity, first time entering into college, um, or, or any other uh, categories that you want to kind of um, prioritize at the university level. 
In terms of preliminary um, scores around uh, field testing items, no, we don't release that information. But um, really, truly, the purpose of looking at those field testing items is to make sure that they um, are performing in the way that we intend for them to perform. Um, so as we're looking at them, we're, we're making sure that bias is not associated with those field testing items. Um, so that if, you know, for example, if, you know, all African Americans are failing one particular question or not answering one question right, and then every other population is, then there's a problem with that item. Uh, similarly, if all women are not answering a question correctly, one particular question correctly, but we see all men answering that same question correctly, then there's an, there's an issue with that item and that item is eventually uh, flagged and pulled from, from the um, test formation process. And then other items are added in. So we kind of walk through that process um, just to make sure that um, all questions are fair and, um, and, um, and reliable in that, in the testing process. Thank, thank you, Malik. Um, mm -hmm. Hattie, do we usually go with the recommended um, uh, pass score in Virginia? Is that what we typically um, go with? Aptel historically has either recommended the multi-state um, score, the recommended pass score, or in some cases has gone one CSEM below. And let me explain that, um, you know, it really varies from test to test. We're a little later adopting this test than other states, but we have um, been in the forefront of making recommendations to the board on brand new tests that have never been given. So in this case, we do have some data as far as what other states have done as far as what they've recommended. But in the past, we've been blind. I can see Nancy kind of shaking her head. She's familiar with, with that. We've done that in the past where we didn't know what other states were going to do. And so Abtel said, let's go one CSEM below and see how we do, how our um, candidates in Virginia um, test. Because it's, as you know, historically, it's, um, it's not as hard to increase a score, but it's hard to lower one once that standard has been made. So it's either been the recommended passing score since we've been going multi-state. We've been doing that for some years. Previously, we always had our own standard setting study, but we've gone with the multi-state standard setting study, which has worked well for us, or they've gone one CSE and below. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Nancy's got yeah, her hand up. I do. Thank you, uh, Tracy, uh, Tricia, um, and, and Patty. I just would like to frame the conversation as we discuss this further that I believe that the middle education six through eight science endorsement is listed on the critical shortage area. And as Malik had mentioned with the other yes. states when they had discussions and considerations of the, of the final score, um, and, and what they were going to recommend, that actually played into the conversation. So I would like to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. And if we, I could, we, just for some of the newer people mm -hmm. on Abtel who've not been through this process before, I know our college folks are more familiar and some people who've been on Abtel, but I'm not sure everyone is totally aware of how we use this test because it's used for a variety of um, licensure processes. For example, um, individuals who are in approved programs, as Dr. Dare mentioned, they are completing these tests to be a program completer. That's one area the tests are used. Also for initial licensure in Virginia, we have alternate routes whereby individuals may demonstrate proficiency in um, their content area by taking this test. For example, we have an alternate route called experiential learning. So if someone has three years of professional work experience or work experience, um, it doesn't have to be related to the science, to science, but they can take this test to demonstrate their proficiency even if the major in college was not necessarily science. Also, we use this um, test for add-on endorsement. So individuals who hold 
a teaching license in Virginia, such as a collegiate professional, postgraduate professional, it does not work for all license types, such as people personnel, or you cannot add it to a division superintendent license, but one can take and pass this test and add this endorsement by testing. We see that for candidates in approved programs who major in say middle school English, middle school social studies who may take this test, their program was in those other two areas, but add by testing. School divisions have found this extremely helpful when they are um, interviewing candidates whose degree may not be exactly aligned with our licensure regulations, but they can take this test. And if they can demonstrate that they have the knowledge and skills in this area by passing the test, they can add the endorsement by testing. So I just thought it was important for you to understand that this test is used for a variety of reasons, but primarily to demonstrate one's content knowledge in the particular area of middle school science. Is there, can we have a discussion about a recommended score and your thoughts about the recommended score of 61, which is scaled to 152 or something else? Hi, this is Nancy Welch. Um, I would like to recommend the 147, which is one standard deviation below the recommended scale score equivalent. Um, uh, listening to um, Dr. Dare when he was uh, having the conversation and sharing concerns about the, um, uh, I guess the responsiveness of what ETS is doing to make sure that the, that, that the test is valid and equitable um, across all ethnicities. Um, that is a concern of mine. You know, ha having, to, having seen my own faculty and staff struggle with some of these assessments, I believe that that would be fair um, an, an equalizer, um, if I may add, um, to some of our um, African-American or, and our people of color. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, Other oh, this is Gary Carter. I would have to agree with, with uh, Nancy. That was, that was in the back of my mind as well, um, all the things she mentioned, as well as the fact that I don't think we have an overabundance of middle school science teachers just waiting to find a job somewhere. Uh, so I'm, I'm in line with, with Nancy's train of thought. This is Jennifer. Um, as somebody who took the middle school science praxis in order to become highly qualified way back when, when you had to be highly qualified as a special ed teacher, I would uh, agree with Nancy um, that we need to uh, be, and Andrew especially, about being very careful, and Gary, about um, setting the bar at a reasonable level um, for this, for this, for any praxis, but particularly for, for science, because that is another, overall, it's a critical shortage area. This is Peggy Schimler. I agree with that. We have many of our candidates who are first generation students who struggle with these assessments and um, will fail them two or three times, which is difficult because they're also students who have limited resources. So I agree that we need to set the bar at a reasonable rate. Um, not that we're lowering the bar, but we're setting the bar at a rate that captures all of the uh, candidates who want to become, sci especially science teachers. I would add that if we have candidates from Virginia, we are not an NGSS state, even though we address national standards in our teacher preparation programs. It's not something that many are familiar with. Other thoughts about 147? Do we have a motion? So moved, Gary Carter. Second. Gary, can you state the motion for us, please? Uh, yes, I move that we adopt the 147 pass rate for the science middle school praxis. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Peggy Schimler, I second. Thank you, Peggy. 
Any further discussion? So the motion is that Abtel recommends a 147 uh, passing score on the Praxis Middle School assessment. I will um, call the roll for your votes. Um, Andrew Dare. Yes. Nancy Welch. Yes. Gary Carter. Aye. Tracy Mercier. Yes. Philip Watt. Yes. Arletta Williams. Yes. Uh, Steve Witten. Yes. Wendy Downey. Yes. Jessica Jones. Yes. Jennifer Andrews. Yes. Diane Stubbins. Yes. Nancy Bradley. Aye. Andy Cox. Aye. Peggy Schimler. Yes. Sarah Gross. Aye. Travis Burns. I sorry I was having trouble with my mute. You're fine. Cardell Patillo. Yes. Senator McClellan, is she back? Nope, she had to step out. Uh, Delegate Van Valkenburg. Yes. Yes, and I vote yes as well. Thank you all. I appreciate that. And Malik, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and uh, present to us. The next item Absolutely. on thank the you. agenda. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, and now that I've lost my agenda, too many papers here, sorry, is, oh, sorry, here it is. The recommendation for licensure renewal requirements and the licensure regulations for school personnel. Patty is going to lead that discussion. Thank you, Tricia. And on the last item before I get to this, this item, the Board of Education many times would like to have the rationale of Abtel for its recommendation. And I just wanted to run by you what I jotted down, that this is a brand new test. It has not been given, it's new, newly developed. Um, that another justification is this is a critical shortage teaching area in Virginia and that we um, as Virginia have not adapt, adopted um, the NGF standards um, statewide. Any other that I missed, I just wanna make sure that I am reflecting your recommendation appropriately. Thank you. Moving on to a very big project for Abtel, we have had several discussions on recommendations for licensure renewal requirements in the licensure regulations for school personnel. Last um, time we met in September, we had a lively discussion which was so productive and so helpful to discuss how we wanted to make a recommendation to the Board of Education. We didn't have any motions, we, no decisions were made, but we had um, a discussion about what those topical areas may be and how many points may be required for renewal. So for the new folks, I'm just gonna give you a really quick overview of where we are with renewal. As probably all of you know, for many years in Virginia, we had five-year licenses. Year, many, many years ago, we actually did have 10-year licenses. We had five-year licenses for many decades. And then it was changed by the General Assembly in 2018 that we were to issue 10-year licenses instead of five-year licenses. So as a result of that, we were looking at the number of points to renew. For a five-year license, we had required 180 professional development points through eight options. It, after much discussion with Abtel, Abtel made a recommendation to the Board of Education. The Board of Education approved 270 professional development points for renewal of a 10-year license. However, in doing so, the Board of Education asked that the department in Abtel begin reviewing 
the professional development requirements and how the renewal system may need to be revised. It's been many years since the individualized system of renewal was created and we needed to revisit that, look at the topics that were required and you received a, um, a recommended proposal from the Department of Education. It was, it was very much a draft. Nothing was decided. We just provided you with um, a plan just to get some conversation about what you perceive renewal should be. And in that, it was suggested that Abtel begin discussions about whether or not there were specific areas of professional development that should be required for renewal. We know that there are statutory requirements that the General Assembly um, is requiring that all licensees complete for renewal. We have child abuse and neglect recognition and intervention training. We have emergency first aid, CPR and AED training. We require dyslexia awareness training for school counselors. They have a specific training as well as those who are teaching middle school civics, which are primarily individuals who have middle school endorsements or who have high school endorsements and can teach those courses. Each of those statutory trainings are composed of five points. So one of the topical areas that we had discussed was certainly they have to do the statutory requirements. There's no give on that. There's really no recommendation needed, but they would get the points for those particular requirements. Abtel early on, months ago, when we first introduced this topic, was uh, made a recommendation that in the renewal requirements, there should be mandatory training in diversity and equity, cultural competence. Um, and we've talked about what that title should be. And at our last meeting, there was a suggested title of diversity, equity, cultural responsiveness and competence, anti-racist practice. And as you know, we are looking at adding a standard to the performance standards for teachers, which should be aligned to renewal as well. You can see on the second page of your item that there were, we had discussions about what were these topics. Some people call them buckets. Topics is probably, um, what most of us refer them to. And I think what we need to do now is to have a discussion on what topics do we want to require? And there was much um, discussion about what should be required, what should be left to teachers. There were concerns expressed during the last meeting about making sure that whatever topics are recommended, that there be definitions for those particular topics and how could we regroup or maybe combine them. There was also a, um, a comment, I think it was Selena who brought it up, who was concerned about individuals who may be enrolled in a master's program, someone who has um, been working on a master's degree, perhaps doesn't have something in each of those topical areas and would they need to complete additional work. There was also discussion about the timeline. We, I think there was concern when we went to a 10 year license that people would wait until the very last year, the 10th year to meet their requirements. And so we talked about possibly saying, maybe not mandating, but saying encouraging um, licensees to take at least half of their points during the first five years for renewal. And we want to make sure that all the renewal requirements and professional development requirements are aligned with Board of Education objectives, as well as the aligned with the performance standards and evaluation criteria for teachers. Today, I wanted to, to pose to you perhaps maybe um, two options, we can continue because we meet again in January and we will take all the comments today. 
I think today, if you have specific things that you want to do, perhaps a motion would be helpful so we know what the pleasure of the entire group is instead of one or two individuals making those comments. If we want to look at what those topical areas should be, we also could um, do just as I said, but have a smaller group of Abtel to work on some definitions of those topical areas and bring those back in January so that we're not doing all of that online today as far as what those topical areas are. Um, but we do need to get something to the board, I would say within you know, the next couple of meetings of Abtel. Um, so I'd like to hear from you if you would like to have a smaller group, do some additional work between now and in your January meeting, or whether you would just like to continue as one group, that's totally up to you. Tricia? Thanks, Patty. Folks, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, Patty, I'm, I'm okay with either way the group decides, but I just want to make one comment that with, with the area of diversity, equity, and, and I know it says cultural competence here, and we've talked about cultural responsiveness. Um, I would encourage us to work with the VDOE equity office regarding definitions, because um, I know the African American um, History in Education Commission, we made some re recommendations specific to that. And mm -hmm. I know VDOE is also looking at things and I think it would be important to make sure that there's consistent language um, throughout all of those areas because I believe we are one of two or three groups that are making recommendations specific to this area. Andrew, I'll, I'll right. mention I served, served on the second, the work group that actually addressed uh, this particular category, which currently is entitled culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices. And the representative from that office is serving on the, the subgroup of the, of the working group. So hopefully, um, and, and she was, I, I think, rightly brought forth language and, and issues for us to consider. And Patty, you sat in on that group as well. Right, Le Leah Walker, many of you know her. Um, she has led much of this work for us at the Department of Education, and she is um, helping us with the performance standards and making recommendations. So she has the, the, the big picture. So I think that's a, a, a wonderful suggestion, Dr. Dare. And, and just so you all know, there's also an African-American superintendent's advisory committee mm -hmm. that is also looking at these recommendations. So just so that folks can be aware. Right, and Leah sits on that as well. So she is really a good person to help us with this. And she helped a lot with um, wordsmithing the performance um, standard. And even though we haven't gotten feedback yet from all of the members, we can certainly bring that information back to you um, at the January meeting as well. And maybe it would just be helpful just to get more feedback from you all on what those topics are. And I see Nancy has her hand raised. Thank you, Patty. Um, I'm feeling the need after um, you know working with the work group on the on uniform performance standards for teachers to align the language that we have in that standard six, uh, cultural responsive teaching equitable practices to the, the, the recertification um, you know, matrix here. Um, and so I'll just kind of float that idea you know, if we can possibly agree to change uh, the title of diversity, equity, and cultural competence, um, that particular one to the same language as the teacher evaluation plan moving forward. Initially, is everyone good with that? Because if we, I mean, I don't think we need a necessarily a motion or a vote today, but I just would like to hear from everyone. Um, and, and it could change and be tweaked a little bit. And there's also a definition, but they're using the culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices is where they've landed at this point. But again, 
that may change um, once the entire group responds. What we did for this meeting was we split into three groups. One group met specifically for this particular performance standard. One group met to look at all other standards to tweak the language and align those particular standards. And a third group looked at data and artifacts necessary for renewal. So the three groups now, all their information has been put together, combined, and we are seeking um, recommendations from the entire group. They are going to meet again in um, December. So we will have a better idea of December what those definitions likely may look like so that we can bring that back to you in January. Is that agreeable with everyone? I agree with Nancy, having served on both committees. I think we should align that language as much as possible to, to alleviate any confusion or, or to strengthen actually what we're looking at. So if we could find a way to, to um, even as we're going between the two groups, make sure that that aligns, I think that would be best for for us and for teachers. Uh, Gary Carter, again, I agree with both Nancy's. I believe um, the more alignment we can have with terminology, with definitions, uh, uh, labels, I think it would help statewide with anybody who is looking into adopting any of this or just referencing any of this. I think the, uh, uh, the more streamlined we can make it and more consistent, we can make it across all the groups across the state. Um, I think it would be beneficial in the long run. Thank you. Do we have anyone who is opposed to, um, it, I mean, certainly you have, you'll have more time for input, but for today, can we um, go ahead and for that particular um, topic, which I know Abtel definitely wants to be required. We'll have to determine how many points you want of um, the 270 to be in that area. But is everyone okay with trying to align this with the performance standards language? Okay. Patty, I think Delegate Van Valkenburg had a comment. Oh, sure. Uh, no, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I guess I was just trying to, I was trying to take a step back as the new person on here and just make sure I was reading everything correctly. Um, when I'm looking at the document and we're talking about how it used to be, right, you had to get a certain amount of points and there's these eight areas where you can get, you know, you can get up to 270 points for college credit, right, or 60 points for a conference. And when you scroll that second page and there's those eight bullets, are we working towards making it so that when teachers get relicensure, they would have to get a minimum amount of points within each of those categories. So like you know, what we're talking about now, diversity, equity, cultural competence, but like they'd have to get, you know, 10 points in data analysis and instructional planning. I just want to make sure I'm reading that right before I go any further. You are reading that exactly um, correctly. The, the issue is which categories do we want to mandate a minimum number of points? As you will see on that page, there are a few items that actually have some points for discussion behind them, but there's some others that may just be optional, but that there would be some that would be mandated. For example, the second bullet is um, school division professional development and learning, that if one is employed by a Virginia educational agency or a school division, that some of their points need to be earned um, through professional development offered by the school division. These are all up for discussion, but you are reading that correctly, but there may be topics from which individuals may choose or select to complete requirements but there's not a minimum number of points in that particular topical area. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Jennifer Andrews. So um, Delegate Van Valkenburg's question actually made me look at this again more closely. So I noticed that in the list of possible topics and maybe professional development points, 
content knowledge, parentheses, to add an endorsement or expand knowledge uh, or expertise in a teaching assignment. So I already mentioned that I took the uh, middle school science praxis in order to become highly qualified back in the day with No Child Left Behind when special ed teachers had to be highly qualified. I have since taken the earth and space science and practice uh, praxis and passed, and that has now been added to my license um, because of course you can add a licensure area by testing. So, but this phrasing of the content knowledge to, parentheses to add an endorsement, et cetera, makes me wonder if that ability to add an endorsement through testing would go away if we required that. Um, I mean, the, I passed this, uh, the earth and space science and the middle school science praxis because I was working as a special education teacher collaborating in earth science classrooms uh, and gained enough knowledge that I was able to pass both tests. Um, it makes me wonder that if, whether or not in the future, if I wanted to add an area of for endorsement, would I have to then take um, certain credits or uh, demonst demonstrate through ways other than testing that I knew this information. Um, so that, that would be a concern because I think the ability to add through testing is a really valuable one especially when school divisions are trying to hire people um, and they're, they're short in, in the critical areas, uh, critical teaching areas. I would say thank, thank you, Jennifer, for those comments. I think that's um, helpful. The, the renewal of a license though would be separate and apart from adding an endorsement through a testing option. But I do understand what you're saying but this wouldn't, um, this is an area content knowledge where there weren't specific number of, of points listed, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and it could be because this is all up for discussion, but the adding endorsements by testing would be a separate matter. However, I do think that some individuals, and, and let me use ESL as a example because I have a pretty good one from the um, community college. The community college has a, um, a tutorial for the ESL praxis test. Um, and Educate Virginia through their career switcher program offers, and Dan is very familiar, provides this tutorial for individuals who want to take the ESL test, maybe have some experience, but are not as confident in taking the test and want to go through this training. So it could be that that training that they engage in, as long as it meets the requirements for the renewal, um, meets the criteria, you could use that toward renewal, but the actual test itself and adding the endorsement would be separate. Mm -hmm. So I also, I, my original endorsement is in history and social studies. So I do, have the requirement of the uh, Virginia history slash state local government module that I have to do in order to continue that license. But, um, you know, so I'm very, you know, I want, I just want to make sure that people are still able to, I mean, I haven't had to renew and de then demonstrate additional science knowledge or, uh, and of course I do demonstrate the history knowledge by you know, completing the module as required. But um, I just, I wanna make sure that people will still be able to keep the license area that they have, the endorsements that they have. Right, and for renewal, you don't have, you wouldn't have to complete content knowledge in every area. However, unless, but you made a really good point, the statutory requirement for those who are teaching the civics, they do have to complete um, that tutorial, which is five points for each renewal cycle. So you're absolutely correct. I don't envision that that's um, where we would go with this. And I think it's up to Aptel when you're making your recommendations, what areas are you going to require that all licensees, and we're not talking about just teachers, but teachers, principals, et cetera, 
counselors, everyone who has a license, including division superintendents. What are the categories or topics that you want to recommend that they have to include in their renewal training? So it could be that content knowledge would be one of those topical areas, but not attach any specific number of points to that particular option. I think that the, the area that I heard a lot of discussion that you did want to attach some points was in social emotional learning, trauma-informed mm -hmm. teaching strategies and classroom management. So um, it might be helpful to speak to that one to see if that is another area um, that Abtel is, thinks is, it should be a mandated number of points. Patty, the other area I'll just bring up as we're talking about mandates is, and as we're talking about alignment of titles, the, the new standards for uh, technology are actually called digital learning integration standards. And I think we should adopt the language of digital learning integration. Um, but I also think given where we are today, and, and I hate the word pivot, but I'm gonna use it, the, the way we've had to pivot to remote instruction, we have no idea what technology is going to look like in 10 years when we when we get our licenses. So I, for one, would argue that that should probably be one of the mandated areas in terms of points. And I will open the floor to others for discussion of social emotional learning or any other category that you think we should mandate points in. It's not necessarily a question about mandating points, but it is it is a related question. We had a really robust discussion about a maybe about a year ago about micro credentials um, mm -hmm. and how they would be integrated or included in renewal of teacher licensure. And I don't see anything on this document about micro credentials, but I guess my question is, are they going to be talked about as far as which categories they should be accepted in and which categories they wouldn't necessarily be a good fit for because I think you and this was my concern a year ago I think you can find a micro credential in probably just about anything at this point online and it doesn't mean it's a quality educational program and it doesn't mean it's from a good source um, and so I'd like to see that as part of this discussion also. Thank you Mary and welcome. The General Assembly did request the Department of Education to present a plan to the General Assembly concerning micro-credentialing specific to STEM. And there is a plan that will be submitted to the General Assembly by December 1. And um, I imagine that the thing is, with that plan, it is specific to STEM, not all areas. However, um, the ASCD is also looking at micro-credentials and how they can be vetted. So I think as we move forward, you will see processes where the department um, will actually vet or review certain micro-credentials to ensure that they um, are of high quality to use for renewal and perhaps make some recommendations um, in that regard. But micro-credentials now could be used for renewal as long as they meet the requirements of the renewal system. And option um, eight, professional development. If someone completed an activity to, uh, in micro-credentialing and perhaps got a whole stack of micro-credentials that it probably took them well over five hours of time to um, complete that and as such could use it for renewal. So I do think though that it would be helpful in the recommendation to the board to make it clear that micro-credentials could be used toward renewal. So I think that's a really good point that we have sort of lost along the way, but thank you so much for mentioning that again. Patty, I would just like to echo Mary's point. I think she raises a really brilliant point with respect to micro-credentialing and how we can maybe address 
you know, what I see without, with a lack of a better way of capturing, there's a lot of loosey goosey point giving going on. Um, and, you know, I think Mary's point is, you know, trying to make sure that, that there's um, some high quality, um, you know, professional development being tied to professional points. I mean, you know, the Microsoft Office certification, the Google certification, those are all examples of some good credentialing. So Mary's onto something huge here and, and I echo her point. Thank you, Travis. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Yes, so um, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to lower my hand, but anyway, I'll do that after I speak. So uh, following along with the idea of um, this is a 10 year license we're looking at uh, a year ago, if anyone had said that we would be teaching virtually, I would have said you're crazy. If in April you had said that, I would have said you're crazy. Um, we have two areas that are proposed for general licensure, uh, the um, diversity, equity, and cultural competence, and the professional development and learning, uh, and the social, actually three, social, emotional, um, tra learning slash trauma-informed strategies. So those three areas are already in our discussion that we're listing. Please do focus, make sure you have something in these three areas. Um, I mean, things have changed so much since I got my license to begin with, all right, 1976. And to 10 years down the road, if I was to renew now, 10 years down the road, who knows what things are gonna look like. I would favor um, keeping the specifics of what categories and how many points to a minimum because we don't know what's coming down the pike. I mean, um, this year has just shown us that that's, that's when you had to make a change, you've made a change and in my school division has provided tons of professional development to make sure that our staff were ready to teach virtually when the school year started. And I'm thankful that they, that they spent that time. I know other school divisions who didn't spend, who didn't have the ability to spend as much time doing that. And I know teachers are struggling. If we um, micromanage, if you will, the categories and points for this 270 proposed points, I think we're gonna be tying the hands of, um, of people who are looking to renew. We're look, tying the hands of uh, uh, teacher preparation programs when they're trying to uh, help students uh, make sure that they have, I guess it wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't, anyway. So the point is just don't tie people's hands, especially when we're trying to make sure that people are able to become teachers. We already have shortages of teachers um, in, this, in this country at this point. Uh, don't make it harder. I guess, Patty, I'm unsure of why we need the school division professional development and learning. I think any teacher employed in a school division that will be a given. So I guess I don't understand the need to even include that as a category because we know that, that it will be addressed um, by anyone who's employed in a school division. And I would hazard a guess to say, even in private schools, they're going to be doing the same kinds of things. So um, if we wanna limit categories, I think that's one way to do it. Um, are there other thoughts about the categories that we may wish to list, whether they have you know, minimum point requirements attached to them or not. One thing I think we need to keep in mind too, having done this myself, is there are people who will go up for, for licensure renewal who will not be in a school system. Um, I renewed a license when I was um, in my PhD program. And so, 
you know, I mean, I had things I could add in there, but there are people who choose to stay at home for a while or whatever, who are going to renew their license. So I also think that that supports being careful about what we require that they take and how we provide access to that. Um, Cause I think that's an important part. And, you know, following up Jennifer, I think she's absolutely right. I think we need to, to give school systems a credit for especially things like, I mean, you know, teachers have so much technology that they did this spring into this fall. I think that's an ongoing area that most school systems are addressing as technology changes and also um, the professional development piece. So I agree that the more we could limit the number of categories we require, the better. Thank you. Diane, did I see your hand earlier? Yes, I think uh, what some other folks have said earlier is appropriate that we could have some mandatory requirements in areas that we deem really necessary, culturally responsive practices and things like that. But we could still offer useful uh, ideas about technology integration and computer science to, to let people know that yes, that too would count just so they would sort of know that it's not just in their content area or just instructional practices or assessments or whatever. Um, we could, we could, if we were just in these suggested categories, uh, data analysis, assessment, and instructional planning would just cut down on the verbiage to combine those two by adding assessment to the to the one. But but offering those as these are options out there, but the required ones are these two that we've highlighted. Thank you, Diane. Delegate Van Valkenburg. Yeah, thanks. I, I would just add too that I think one of the problems with mandating, there's two problems with mandating too many things. One is that it just becomes a checklist that teachers check off rather than take seriously, but also it dilutes the things that you actually want people to take seriously. And I think of all the things that are on this list, the one we should want people to take seriously, I mean, we should have always wanted them to, but it's, it's even more important now is, is the diversity and equity piece. And if we really wanna say that that's something that all teachers need to have, and I, and I think it is, I think we should focus on that. And I would encourage us to take the, the rest of the things on that list, keep it advisory, don't make it mandatory. But I would also, I think it, I think, because I think a lot of school systems do this and it could encourage the ones that aren't, but I would actually encourage us too to put it under content. So that when you're saying, you know, hey, we want to do, you know, we want data analysis and instructional planning. Well, that means something different for social studies than it does for, mm -hmm. for science or band. And I think that's one of the things we lose when we pull those skills out and we separate them from content. Like I think an ideal teacher training is doing both, right? It's, it's you're, you're doing a summer institute on technology and how to teach primary sources and secondary and social studies or something. And if it's just out in isolation, it allows people to get points for things that aren't helpful to helping them teach like the Lincoln Douglas debates or something. So I guess those are just the things that I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Andy. And just for clarification, um, options one through seven are not changing. Is that correct? The options themselves, I mean, I think the whole renewal um, process is up for recommendations if you have a specific recommendation in that regard. No, I was just, I just for, for clarification, and then I started thinking about how some of these could be a bit confusing in which category this would count for this, but um, um, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? And I apologize, I owe you all an apology. It's 11, 12, and I did not give you a break <laughs> earlier. So I, I think we're just going to push on for a few minutes. And when we finish this discussion, if you feel you need one, I'll, I'll ask. But at that point, we'll be up to just uh, reports from our liaison. So apologies to you. Other thoughts about this? Patty, what else do you need from us at this point? I think I would like to have some consensus. I'm hearing some things, but I'm not sure that everyone is in agreement. Um, I'm hearing that that certainly the statutory requirements, they are imposed by the General Assembly. So those are things that teachers have to do and they have to earn those minimum points. I'm also hearing that perhaps we should look at the very, give licensees some flexibility in what they choose to complete or what they may need because of changing instructions such as online learning that many teachers have had to immerse themselves in and learn in, in since COVID. 
So I guess and I'm really hearing only two areas that you are really in favor of possibly requiring. And I'm also hearing that perhaps we should only um, include diversity, equity, and cultural competence or whatever we're gonna call that, which culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices. And then I'd like to hear from you about whether or not you want to require some of the points to be earned in social emotional learning from informed teaching strategies, classroom management. Can you help me know where you're going with those areas? Maybe do it this way. First, how many people would like to limit the topics that are mandated for licensees? Can you just raise your hand physically? Okay, a few people I can't see, but, oh, I see, but thumbs up. Looks like everyone's in favor of that. Okay, good. Um, what about focusing on diversity, equity, uh, culturally responsive teaching and equitable practices and only mandating points in that area along with the statutory requirements. Can you raise your hand if that's where you are landing? Okay, it looks like some folks may not be on board with that. Um, who wants to also require that all licensees complete something in social emotional learning trauma-informed teaching strategies and classroom management. Who wants to require that as well? Okay, I'm seeing kind of a, a split. So maybe um, it would be helpful for us to have a little bit of discussion um, for those who want to require training in social emotional learning, et cetera. Um, Nancy, you had your hand up. You want to speak first? Thank you, Tricia. Um, you know, when, I'm, when I'm looking at these, the two areas that really float to the top for me is that cultural responsive teaching and equitable practices, as well as that social emotional learning and the trauma informed teaching strategies. And I think that that is so much more important today than it was 12 months ago. Um, given the situation that we've all been in, not just for our students, but I think it's very valuable for our faculty and our staff, your administrators, your superintendents, um, to, to have more of an insight for the social emotional learning and trauma informed strategies. Um, you know, we, we've all been under a tremendous amount of strain and hopefully in a 10 years time, we won't be in the same situation, but one never, one never knows. And all educators, no matter what your position, what your title is, needs to have the strategies in their toolbox uh, to be able to address these individual situations, whether it's with your students or whether it's with your, your faculty and staff. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address this area? Charletta? Yes. Hey, um, so I kind of I want to piggyback off what Nancy just said. I agree. Those are the two top in my book, um, I think, should be addressed first. And as um, Delegate Van Valkenburg said earlier, kind of take the other subjects, topics, and kind of try to condense some of those because a lot of them are the same, related somehow. So um, that's just, I mean, to me, those two top, top those two topics are really near and dear right now, especially with, like you said, the virtual learning in most cases or blended learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Jessica. Um, I, I know that it's an important topic that needs to be addressed, but I also, from being in a situation of in-person learning, hybrid learning or remote learning, I think there's some aspects of it that we need more research and information on. And until we can really get what it, how we can actually reach our children appropriately, I, I don't wanna mandate somebody 
to do something in the middle of not knowing what's going on. Uh, and that's really where my heart is and having to see that there are some uh, educators struggling themselves that we need to have more of an approach to work with our educators where they are. Um, and then maybe a year or two from now to make it a mandate. But in the current situation, I I'm struggling with that because there's just so much to handle. And I cannot say that any one of us is an expert on where we should start but I would hope that we would start with working with the needs of, of our educators and where they are and make sure they're strong enough to handle the situations and what's going on with our students where they are because not everybody's in the same place at the same time. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I'll piggyback on that, this is Skylar. Um, I, I think socioeconomic or socio-emotional learning is super important, but I also think it works much better when it bubbles bu bubbles up from the bottom and school systems are doing it. And I, and I worry about us saying, we're gonna mandate it across the board. And then we get a bunch of trainings that just aren't up to snuff, don't do a good job. People just kind of mindlessly go through online and, and call it a day. And, um, and that's my big worry about it. I think people are acknowledging it and we're seeing trainings happening in different localities. And so I just, I understand the importance of it. I just don't know that us mandating it does what we think it will do. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think the diversity piece, I think us mandating it is, is, is super important um, in the Commonwealth we live in and in the kind of world we live in. And I think can have make concrete difference. Thank you. Other thoughts? I, I, I think that's a, a, a good point um, that um, Scholar just mentioned. Um, but on the other side of it, sometimes if we don't mandate these things in policy, they just don't happen. So I don't know how we navigate that. Um, but I think it's a good point. And I don't know if we need to be tighter about um, expectations for professional development that's provided in those areas. But um, I'm always a little bit, well, I shouldn't, I'll phrase it this way, that I really see the value of really putting things in policy to ensure that they happen. I will say that the latest revision of the, the licensure regulations and approved program regulations trauma-informed care was added to the competencies for foundations of education. It was not there to begin with. So this is a relatively new piece in terms of training our teachers. Are we thinking of it as a situation where expecting a minimum of these 15 credits is something that will become a barrier that would stop someone from completely pursuing the renewal of their license? Is that why we're trying to limit how many mandated things we have? Or is it more a situation where you think it would be difficult for people to find a place to, to get those 15 credits? What's, what's the problem um, that we think this would cause by adding one more mandated thing. I guess so it would only be two because it would be cultural responsiveness and then the trauma informed. Um, Mary, I, I like what you said. I mean there are only two. Um, and I think they're they're two very much needed items. Um, I don't think it's going away. I don't think it's new. I think it's just now uh, as, as far as the trauma thing goes, um, I, I, I would lump that under basically mental health. And I think it's just now coming more to light. And I think we have the opportunity to, um, I mean, we're talking about what, 15 points in 10 years. That's not very much. Uh, and I, I mean, we, we may mandate a uh, certain training module but it's, it's basically learning how to deal with, cope, identify, and help those with any sort of mental health issue, uh, be they teachers or students or administrators or anybody in that position, just it's, it's, it's awareness and it's um, acceptance and it's, uh, and it's basically just general education about what that mental health 
entails and, and just how to identify and help people. And I don't see that as being um, a hindrance to getting the 270 points. Uh, and keep in mind, it was over 10 years and we're only talking 30 points max between the diversity and the mental health thing. Uh, there's 240 more points that people can get. Thank you, Gary. I've got Nancy and then Skylar. Um, real quick, thank you, Gary. You just made me trigger. So why couldn't we use the school counselor module that's already in place? Um, that's one of the, under the mandatory uh, statutory requirements. That's five points of the 15. So if we, if we utilize what's already in place, that would meet the mental health disorder, behavioral stress, including depression, trauma, violence, suicide, and substance abuse. I've not taken that training personally, so I don't know if it would be relevant to this particular area. And see, my only caution with that is that, that those were specifically um, developed for individuals who have masters in counseling. So it may not be appropriate for everyone to do that. And I do know that um, the Department of Education has provided some types of uh, professional development and learning in this regard. So um, that would limit them to just doing the online work instead. So that would be my only you know, caution is that I think those tutorials um, working with counselors are assuming that they already have some type of background before they complete them. Okay, great, thank you. But good idea, yeah. Tyler. Oh, I'm good, my hand was up from before. You're good, okay, thanks. Andrew, were you, are you on my list? No, I was just apologizing for talking out of turn when I responded to Delegate Van Volkenberg. I'm good. <laughs> no, no worries. Trisha, um, this is Travis. If, if yes, no one Travis. else, I'd like to just raise a point. Sure. I know we've talked about professional development, particularly I think we're targeting you know, teachers, but let's not forget about principals and administrators, central office staff in terms of their licensure renewal. And I just, you know, I want to underscore the importance of professional development that, you know, maybe down the road, we could as a group talk a little bit more about mentorship and coaching training for principals mm -hmm. and, you know, central office staff. As we know, you know, principals and, and building level administrators, they, they may not have a direct impact on student achievement, but they do have an impact on school climate and culture that directly impacts, of course, student achievement. And so I think we you know, oftentimes when we talk about PD, we, we tend to focus on teachers and we need to recognize the importance of principals and, and central office staff and, and, and superintendents. And I think the best way to do that is to maybe down the road, talk about mentorship and coaching training for, um, you know, principals and, and, and central office folks in terms of licensure renewal. But that's probably for another day. That's a big topic. Thank you. Anything else? Patty, do you have a good direction at this point? Or do you need I'm some not, kind of a motion? I'm really not sure where Aptel wants to land with the sep second topic of social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the number of points is something that can be worked out, but I'm not really sure where everyone is landing on whether to make that a requirement or not. Certainly we can discuss it further, but I think for the purposes of presenting another plan to you so that we can get some feedback, it would be helpful to know a little bit more where you, you are with that. Would you like a straw poll? Sure. Uh, by name or just, oh, you want people to raise their hands? However you would like to do is fine with me. Hands are fine either way. Okay, so let, let's do a straw poll. Let's say raise your hand or you know you can do it on the computer or, or live. Um, if you are in favor of keeping social emotional learning, trauma informed teaching strategies, notice classroom management is also in there as a required uh, component of licensure renewal, raise your hand. And we will also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
13, 14, 15, 16. Better idea, Patty? Yeah, it looks like most people want to keep it. OK. And um, are there some individuals who would like to work with, um, with me and my staff on the definitions and trying to get these topics in a better format for you for January? We can certainly take it and run with it. But if there are a few individuals who would like to work with us specifically, um, just let me know. I will, Patty. All right, so I've got Trisha, Andrew, Class Jessica, Andy, Nancy, Tracy. Tracy. Mm -hmm. Who did I leave out? I've got Trisha, Andrew, Andy, Nancy, Tracy. Jennifer, Jessica, sorry. Jessica, I'm sorry, Jessica. I missed. Okay, well, we have a small group and we will um, get together and, and try to come up with some definitions for the topics. And it might be easier for you all to respond to those um, once we massage this a little bit. So thank you very much for the discussion today. This has been most helpful. Thank you. It is 1130. We have liaison reports and announcements. Do you need to take a quick bio break before we come back or press on? I'd see. If you want to press on, raise your hand. If you need a break, we can do that. Hands for pressing on. Okay, we're almost done, I promise. Thank you for that. So um, Dan Lewis, do we have a report from the VCCS? Yes, yes we do. It's on the Career Switcher Program, Teacher Prep Program. Um, for the spring semester, or excuse me, um, 24 students are poised to become licensed um, when the fall semester ends on December 5th. For the spring semester, the programs received more than 100 applications. Uh, students in both the fall and the spring cohorts are um, being instructed fully online in a virtual setting. And then um, mentioning, circling back to what Patty Pitts had mentioned in passing, um, in terms of VA offering ESOL workshops, the workshop series for um, uh, teachers, uh, for those licensed teachers seeking training specific to working with English language learners and preparation for the ESOL practice, practice subject assessment. There's going to be a workshop in January and in March. The one in January is already um, at capacity and there is a waiting list. And uh, this is the this is the, um, the series that's being funded by a VDOE grant. And that concludes my career switcher report. Thank you, Dan. Um, Monica Ose, do we have a report from Chev? And her phone is muted, so I don't know if she is there or not. I will assume Thank no. Thank you. I didn't, you know what it was. I didn't have Thanks. the code. Thank you so much. I didn't have the code. So the, uh, the operator automated thing came on and told me which code to put in to unmute. Um, I do have just a, and, and I believe the EOE knows uh, this mostly, but, but it did come under Chev from our financial aid um, uh, staff member. Uh, there has been money placed in the Grow Your Own Teacher Award for qualifying teachers. Uh, which the, the financial piece comes under CHEV and the program will be administered by the, the Virginia Department of Education. Um, and from what I'm told out of the appropriation, $365,000 each year from the general fund is designed for the Grow Your Own Teacher pilot program to provide grants to uh, high, high school graduates, excuse me, from low-income families who attended an institution of higher education in Virginia and subsequently teach in a high need public school uh, in the school division in which they graduated from high school. So uh, Chev will be um, uh, overseeing the, the financial component of that program. Thank you. Patty, do you have any um, update from the department? 
I gave most of my updates earlier. However, I would call your attention to the Department of Education's webpage. The very front of that web webpage, you can look at the um, FAQs and there is a specific area on teacher education and licensure. So I would invite you to review those waivers and modifications made in the area of teacher education and licensure and any new um, waivers would also be posted there. So I just wanted to call your attention to that website. Um, we are very busy with many grants, many activities. Um, Tara, Maggie, Nancy and I are, are, are busy getting many of those grants out um, from um, funding from the General Assembly. Many of them have already been awarded. So if you have any questions at all, just let us know. And thank you, Tricia, for your leadership. I really appreciate uh, your uh, insight and your help. She's always willing to work on extra committees and do what's ever necessary. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any announcements or discussion for us? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Nancy Bradley. Thank you, Nancy. Is there a second? Second, Nancy Welch. Thank you. Uh, do I need to take a roll call vote, Patty, or can we just raise hands? I think hand? we can just. Yep, all in favor <laughs> of adjourning? Just raise your hand, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for your presence and your time here today. We are most appreciative and we will look forward to seeing you in January. And happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Thank you. Thank you too. You. Thanks so much, everyone. Trisha, and we are planning that to be a virtual visit. Yes. Okay, thanks. Thanks again, Trisha. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Happy holidays and happy, happy new year. I'm sure I'll see you in the next working group meeting. So. Thank you, Maggie, for hosting.